We need to have a real conversation today about our infrastructure. Now, I have two big concerns I want to talk about today. First, we are in real danger of being left behind. Now, let that sink in for just a minute. Other countries are already embedding 5G into their roads. Today, as I'm speaking right now, in the U.S., we can barely keep our bridges from falling down, literally. Sadly, several of our bridges already have. We are barely maintaining the status quo. Now, the good news, though, is that we are at a point where technology is here. It's ready for us to tap into, but we just haven't taken that next step. And that brings me to my second concern today, that we as an industry, a country, need to make a cultural shift. We need to change our mindset. We have been an industry that always focused on projects first and people second. We need to flip that. We need to identify how we can build great workers who can build great projects. Now, did you hear that? Focus on the people first to build great projects. When we work on building our talent, we will build companies that will last a lifetime. They will give back to our communities. They will support future generations and they will innovate for tomorrow. And they will build communities as far as our eyes can see. Today's episode is all about emerging technologies. To open it up, I'd like to narrow in on smart monitoring tools for our infrastructure, which in some ways is emerging, and actually in other ways it is not. Sensors, RFID, and other monitoring systems have been around for decades. Back in 2006, I actually wrote an article for M2M Magazine, which is now Connected World Magazine, about the adoption of the Internet of Things in construction. Back then, corporate owners were adopting structural health monitoring solutions to keep an eye on buildings and infrastructure remotely. It was still very much in the early adopter phase. That was more than 10 years ago, and yet we are still turning on the news every day and hearing about another bridge collapse. Why? This begs the question, why have we as an industry been so slow to adopt all the technology we need? I think there are a few big reasons. First of all, shortly after I wrote that article, the economy fell from underneath itself. The crash of 2009 slowed business and innovation for contractors all across the country. Second, we simply haven't figured out as a country how to fund this. We've talked about this in depth on several episodes already this year, so I won't go into too much detail. But the lack of funding for rebuilding our infrastructure is a real problem. Lastly, I think this is the point that we simply don't talk enough about, that our culture and construction isn't quite as innovative today as other industries. We are very focused on the bottom line and getting tasks completed on time, which is important. But we also need to come up with creative ideas, innovative solutions to the challenges that are right in front of us. There are some pretty cool examples that we will talk about here throughout this entire segment. But let me give you a couple to start with. Smart pavement is being added to the industrial corner of Denver. Sensors in the road can identify speed, weight, direction of a vehicle. This will alert authorities to accidents or help reconfigure lanes to relieve congestion. Here's another one. AECOM points to the use of underground wireless sensor networks to monitor pipes, smart drains that monitor rainfall and address flooding, smart sensors in public waste bins, and the smart grid. Now, just to name a few. The way we can improve our infrastructure with the help of technology is never ending today. We even see LoRa, which is low range, low power, enabled sensors 
being used on conveyor belts in mines to indicate when maintenance is needed. We see an uptick in sensors in all of our infrastructure. Now, Global Market Insights even predicts that smart sensor market will grow 17% through all the way through 2024. And here's what's really exciting. It anticipates that there will be increased investment by the government on smart city developments. More specifically, smart technology will be used as part of the country's infrastructure. I really do hope that that prediction comes true. We so desperately need it. If we don't take big steps now, we're going to be left behind. Other countries are moving fast. Check out what is happening in China. Its telecommunication and expressway operators have agreed to launch a 5G-based smart highway project. 31 5G-based stations were built last year. Another 2,000 will go up in 2019. It will be for smart toll stations but it will also be used for autonomous driving tests on local highways. Imagine the possibilities if 5G was embedded in our expressways. We could have real-time data on traffic. We could make predictions to improve our roads. We are stuck in a perfect storm. We have the technology at our disposal to build high-tech infrastructure that will connect people with data yet we struggle to even keep our infrastructure from collapsing. We need to have a real conversation about how to move all of this forward. So isn't it time we work together to make change start today? What if we could use our smartphones to monitor systems like crumbling roads and aging bridges? What if you knew before crossing the bridge that it wasn't structurally secure? That's what our industry needs. Researchers at the University of Missouri are hoping that by crowdsourcing technology, it will allow for better and more informed decisions to be made. With this system, any person will be able to transmit data wirelessly to a database. Now this is infrastructure connected. I'm so eager to discuss this today. My first guest is Amir Alavi, assistant professor at the University of Missouri. Amir, welcome to the show. Thank you. Good to see you. So, Amir, let's talk a little bit about infrastructure, more specifically smartphones and how they can help monitor what's happening on the roads these days and bridges and all the other things that you guys are doing over there at Mizzou. Okay, that's a very good question. Uh, you know that smartphones are equipped with a number of sensors, okay? And they are also equipped with online computing capabilities, online storage, and also communication. So they are perfect tools for sensing the environment, including civil infrastructure systems. Uh, sensors such as accelerometer, such as uh, GPS, microphone, camera, light sensors, these are all viable tools to monitor many parameters in, related to the condition of civil infrastructure systems. And that's uh, what we are really devoted to promote. So we are using accelerometer to obtain the pavement profile. Uh, we use the camera to detect uh, bridge vibrations and also bridge displacement. We can use microphone to uh, monitor the road texture and too many other applications. When you look at a, looking at something more robust, you know, and more people using it and sharing information, how is that going to be making it more, you know, the nefarious characters out there, you know, making something secure? The more people use it, the more risky it becomes because you're sharing information and that enables the idea of making our infrastructure more vulnerable to, let's say, the bad guys out there. Oh, okay, yeah, this is a very important concern. Like data privacy and security, this is a fundamental concern in any type of citizen research. We all know that because basically people are processing their information through this app, for example, our app, and then online applications, and this poses a lot of risk. So we know that it's risky, but there are also some solutions to deal with this. For example, we can define different layers of security, okay? Basically, we can, uh, these layers of security, they give us, uh, they give the users the opportunity to manage the access, even the administrative access. So they can access that. They can opt out whenever they would like to do. So these layers of security 
to kind of confirm that um, we are in good shape. And then you know what? Basically, for what we are looking for is is not usually very tricky, like acceleration data is not a big concern. Uh, uh, but other modules like camera and um, like a microphone, they are really tricky and we should really should be careful. Are we talking about applications like this that you guys have developed that are being available now and we'll see more and more like this on the market as we move forward and being able to identify weaknesses and structural damage on our roads and bridges and highways as we go forward into the future? Yes, I think this is just the beginning. So it's just tip of the ice. So it's based on the recent uh, survey that we conducted. Okay, everything started uh, in 2008, and until December 2018, I think there there were very limited research in this this area. While the market is massive, the smartphone market is massive. Okay, so I think everything is still in infancy. People are really interested in developing new technologies, new tools, and I think within five years we will see a breakthrough in deployment of a smartphone technology for civil infrastructure monitoring. But perhaps uh, the winning card for us is that we started. Uh, uh, we, I mean, started a little bit more serious than other people, like University of Missouri, University of Illinois, which Dr. Bill Butler is coming from, and also Columbia University. I think we are very few, among the few institutes that are really devoted in promoting that. And we, in fact, we have uh, completed an NSF uh, proposal. We are, get, we are about to uh, submit it and get funding for that to develop a, um, a smartphone hub at national level. So. So where are you in the development of this right now? Yes, we are. In, honestly, we are still in the development phase. We have the app. We are processing the information online, but the app itself has uh, online uh, um, processing capabilities. We have not activated that. So uh, there are a lot of things to be done on this. So, and we are really for, we, we are really going to work on that by this summer. Hopefully, we will have a beta version so that we can release it and people can use it. Uh, but uh, still, the security issue, that's a concern for us, fusing the information, and also machine learning uh, on edge, that's another topic that we are really need to push it uh, forward. Amir Alavi, Assistant Professor at the University of Missouri, thank you so much for being with us. Thank you so much. It was a pleasure being with you, and have a good day. Thank you. As we have already learned, real-time data can give us insight into the health of our infrastructure all around us. Continuing the discussion we have started on our last segment, I'm joined once again by a professor who can help us dig into this discussion a little bit further and dissect how data can help us know how well our infrastructure is doing. My next guest is William Butler, professor at the University of Missouri. Bill, I'm excited to have you on the show today. Glad you could join us. Hey, Peggy, it's great to be with you. Looking forward to the conversation. So let's just get right to it. Let's talk about the Maple Lab. This is really exciting what you're doing over there at Mizzou. Yeah, it's a brand new lab, the Mizzou Asphalt Pavement and Innovation Laboratory. And a little bit about my, my story. I was a professor at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign for 20 years, and I got a call from Mizzou, and they, they were excited. One of the alumni, Glenn Barton, had risen to the CEO position at Caterpillar and was active on our board here at Mizzou. And, and he had made an endowment to start a new lab to solve asphalt problems and to think about the future of transportation infrastructure moving into the next millennium. And so uh, in 2016, I joined Mizzou and, and now we have a fully functional Maple Lab. So we lost you here in Illinois, but something exciting is happening there in Mizzou because you're doing something really great. We have an infrastructure problem, and CAT gets it, and you have a great endowment to do something about it. So now with this whole idea of what you're doing with this lab, talk about you guys are working on some apps, you're try an app, I should say, and you're trying to figure out how to really look at where there's a problem with infrastructure. Help me understand what you hope to accomplish with that. Yeah, yeah, and, and furthermore with the Maple Lab, we work with agencies and industry, and one of the industries that really chipped in was the Missouri Asphalt Pavement Association, so MAPA. 
And uh, yeah, we're solving problems for both the agencies and industries and inventing some solutions on our, on our own. And we use basic material tests all the way up to complex computer models. And these days, big data and apps, just sensors that people have, whether it's uh, the DOT personnel or citizens. I mean, that's the next new frontier is to get data where you can and fuse it together. And so our lab is using every tool and every material at our disposal and, but apps is kind of the next frontier. Is the idea to get road crews to be able to have information when they need it to be able to fix these roads more permanently? Because we know roads are really a problem and we think about what we need to do to fix them in a longer term with better data, right? Yeah, that, that's one of the areas. The, the app is like more than two-way communication. And so this data flowing in to maybe engineers, but also it's going to be automated, and it is with artificial intelligence and, and more specifically machine learning, but, but then it gets pushed back out. So the data then goes back out to the road, and there's all kinds of futuristic stuff going on where I've seen patents and technologies where they're thinking about 3D printing a solution to, to fill crack seals uh, or to fill potholes. Uh, in a simpler form, yeah, it would go out to crews. They would know exactly where the the worst potholes are, the ones that quickly formed and yet they form deep and they're doing damage. And we want to make sure that we can get that real time information out, especially during the free, uh, spree, spring freeze thaw time. So Bill, help us understand how the information is actually going to be used when we talk about the information being sent out to the crews, being then pushed back. How actually will we use all this information that you're talking about? Yeah, the, the data really flows both ways. It kind of flows from the road and then into a, uh, a central database where, you know, we can operate on it with, uh, again, machine learning, um, artificial intelligence. But then it needs to go somewhere. So back out to the people that are fixing the roads. And, and so uh, that can be done in very high tech ways where we could think in the future about automating uh, the filling of cracks with crack sealant or potholes with some kind of a patching mix even with robotic type machines, or just the simply telling the road crews what are the most severe problem, uh, problematic bumps. Because, you know, a small pothole, you could probably wait a week or, or more to fix it. But a large pothole, uh, there have been reports where you could have seven blown tires in a single day and some bent rims. And, and then now you're kind of subject to tort liability and lawsuits. So, you know, an owner agency would really like to know and get after those quick forming uh, potholes and the public would like to not have their cars damaged. We're talking now about emerging technologies. You know, the construction industry is an industry that has never been known in, in the past to be really using advanced things like AI, machine learning, big data. Now with what you're talking about, we're talking about an industry that's actually in some ways actually going to leapfrog some of these other industries with using technology like this. How do you see that really shaping an industry that's getting a D plus when we talk about infrastructure mm. and what we can do going forward and looking ahead and how we can change what we're doing when we talk about our roads, bridges, tunnels, all the things that we're looking at. No, it's an exciting time to be in the field. And I, and I would love to say that we're going to leap forward and have smooth roads everywhere. Think positive, you know. Bill. Think positive. <laughs> but to be, to be uh, honest, I think the first step is just to catch up on the backlog. And so if you could have a transformative breakthrough like this, at least we can start chipping away at the, the backlog and get the bumpier roads smoother and safer. Uh, I think that's the first step. And then maybe we can stay ahead of things because this will help... Uh, really help catch up and stay ahead because when you let maintenance be deferred, there is sort of a ever increasing cost of fixing it. It becomes almost exponentially expensive to fix it. So if you can get at the right places that need repair, get caught up, save money, then you can get ahead and you can really start doing things. Maybe start building tomorrow's infrastructure would be adding lanes or reconfiguring what roads and cities look like in terms of multimodal transportation for future vehicles, more electrified vehicles. But we're not going to get there until we uh, fix what we have. So I'm hoping that this cost savings can be translated into catching up to the backlog first. So we really can be doing a lot of things when we think about urbanization, when we think about what the roads of the future are, which you just described. And this really can contribute to that if we do that. 
What about the young generation that hasn't been interested in being in construction or hasn't been interested in prefabrication, this new type of manufacturing that we're talking yeah. about? Are we talking about that we can inspire another generation to really see the excitement of what new technology is going to be when you're talking about a lab that you're doing, applications, new things that can be generated from this? Absolutely. It's definitely on my mind. I always think about the education side uh, in the classroom, and so I get a lot of feedback. And I can just tell when I talk about the, the old school topics, the students are glad to know it. It's fundamental. Uh, might be on their professional engineering exam. But when I talk about the new technology and new solutions and combining with computer science and other fields, you do see their eyes light up. And, and it's more than that. They volunteer to work in the lab or I can give them a paid position as an undergrad researcher. So it's very tangible that it's attracting uh, a newer, diverse pool of uh, of intellect to the workforce. And I think that can be true all across our industry. If you're talking about other things like intelligent compaction, uh, if you're talking about infrared sensors out on, on the pavers, the plants can be higher tech and cleaner. It's all going to help us attract and retain the workforce that we're going to need going forward, the high-tech workforce. Now, what we're talking about right now is an app. Where are we with the development of this app and actually bringing something to the market? Yeah, the idea of the app in the first place was to use these excellent sensors that are on smartphones. So, yes, it was meant to be a convenient, real-time, cost-effective solution for um, taking pavement roughness measurement, whether it's highway or airfield. Uh, but then there was a thought that this could be a crowdsourcing uh, application where we could get hundreds and thousands of data points from different users, including the public, to help us uh, catch up with evaluating pavements. To give you an example, the standard for pavement evaluation is either a uh, foot on the ground survey where you have two or more people walk down a runway or a road and count you know, uh, representative samples of cracks and, and ruts and potholes. We do have automated vans that can go out and they're loaded with sensors like uh, HD cameras and accelerometers and lasers. Uh, but they can be upwards to a million dollars and the departments of uh, transportation or DOTs are only running them once every year or two. Well, that's not a real-time assessment. It, it's good, but what a smartphone can do is give you the big data, crowdsourced data set that can allow you to measure things that you've never measured before, like the occurrence of potholes, um, the trajectory of, of a problem. You throw that into machine learning, it starts to predict where the next pothole is going to be. That's something we've never thought of is maybe stop these uh, problems dead in their tracks before they happen with preventive type treatments. So we don't have sinkholes. <laughs> we don't want <laughs> well, those either, right? Sinkholes are going to be uh, pretty tough, but uh, hey, if we attach enough sensors and some ground penetrating radar into the mix, then why not? We can find those too. We, right? I mean, the sky's the limit. If we, you know, we're only limited by our imagination with a lot of these things, right? I mean, isn't that eventually what we can do if we take the technology, we look at big data? There's a lot of things you can predict, right, in time? Sure. There's a lot, and, and it's part of a system of systems, and that's another exciting aspect of the future of engineering and civil engineering is we're connecting systems that used to be developed independently. And, you know, an example of that is where we're using a lot more recycled materials to make the pavement more sustainable. We, we recycle more tonnage of materials than any industry, um, but we'd like to use even more recycled materials. But the problem is, can you wait 10 years to know if a certain recycled material type worked or not. Some of the great examples are, we've moved from recycling old pavement into new. We've got that down pretty well. We'd like to do more of it. The latest uh, and greatest is using ground tire rubber in greater quantities in asphalt. Makes it very elastic, very durable, and it's starting to really take uh, hold here in the Midwest. It had really had just been used in a couple of different states in the past. The latest one, though, is the use of uh, waste plastic in asphalt. And so if we can help solve the waste plastic problem, that would be just and an amazing And those cigarette butts still haven't come to fruition yet, right? We haven't figured out if that could work yet. That would be really good if we get that to work enough, right? That, and we've tried putting glass in asphalt, and there's just better use for uh, recycling glass. But these other products that I talked about, uh, there's just millions of tons available, and they can add durability and performance and that's what really sells the sustainability side is when you compare it with economics. So your app right now, will you be able to have something on the market soon? I mean, it'll be free to consumers to actually use and start crowdsourcing all of this information? 
Yeah, that, that's the goal. We've started to really get some interest now that we've published some new reports with the Departments of Transportation. And we, we thought that really the use would be fleets of vehicles like snow plows and police cars and taxis uh, that could be more on the public side and it, it could be enough data. But to get the full public, uh, you know, at general using it would be great, but we didn't want the destiny of the technology be to linked to having general public using it. And so that would be nice to allow the public to play with it. Maybe it could be a playful app that it would be fun to use, but it could also tell them about their route choice. Maybe there's a smoother route into work where you might be paying a fraction more gasoline, uh, but you could be saving 200, 300, 400 dollars a year in repair costs on your car because that's the cost of driving on a rough pavement network is about, on average, 350 dollars per vehicle. You could add gamification to this. Who knows what yeah. you could be doing, right? That's right, and and so it could also be a fun educational tool, uh, also for you know new drivers and uh, not to distract them. It could be done in the background. Uh, you can see all sorts of things that are going on, and you know fusing. We're comparing um, data with uh, other pi public apps and private apps. Uh, it'd be nice if we could merge this technology with what's going on with Waze. I mean, uh, smartphones are already running for navigation. People are tagging things like potholes. But if they could be taking a deeper evaluation like we do with this engineering application, that would be a great fusing of technologies. If you could link this with Pokemon Go, and finding potholes, you've got something going there, Bill. I'm telling you, who knows what you could think. Hey, Bill, it's been great talking to you. I hope you'll come back and tell us how you guys are making progress with this because I think this is exciting stuff. Anytime we can figure out how to make our roads safer for all of us in the future, I think it's a great thing. So Bill Butler, who is the professor at the University of Missouri, thank you so much for your time today. Thanks, Peggy. Looking forward to our next conversation. Appreciate it. What will transportation and concrete pavements look like as we move to the year 2040? That's an interesting question, right? That is the question the American Concrete Pavement Association is answering with its new Vision 2040 initiative. It describes how materials and the industry is changing, all with the help of new and emerging technologies. To talk all about this topic further, I'm so pleased to speak with Leif Watney, Executive Vice President of the American Concrete Pavement Association. Leif, I'm so glad you're joining us today. You bet. So let's talk about this 2040 vision. What are you guys all talking about? And what's the plan here? Well, the Vision 2040 um, effort was really uh, an opportunity to look forward. We were trying to get a handle on um, what the future holds for the transportation sector and more specifically the, uh, the concrete pavement industry. So um, it's not often in our, in our lives that we take the time to stop and do a little pull-up status check, if you will, uh, to kind of see, are we going in the right direction? We're just kind of marching forward, trying to stay ahead of our email and, and what have you. So uh, this is really an overt effort to, uh, to take a brief, brief pause, get some people in a room, and, uh, and talk a little bit about uh, what does the future hold? Uh, are we doing the right things? Uh, what can we do to prepare for that future? That's always exciting when you do get a chance to do that. Now, I understand there's four major goals that you guys have as a part of that. And when you get a chance to look at that, are you hoping that you'll really hit those four goals? Because looking at what we're doing in construction, it's tough to really stay on the mark. Well, um, I, I think so. I, I think uh, the, the group was given broad latitude uh, to look at a number of different things, uh, and that's a little bit of a challenge when you have such a, um, a broad uh, cross-section of the transportation or the, or the highway construction community involved. Uh, we've gotten folks from the National Academies, from Federal Highway Administration, from the State Departments of Transportation, equipment manufacturers, material suppliers, uh, highway constructors, etc. So um, everybody has a little different viewpoint and maybe different um, goals. But um, I think broadly speaking, this, this group um, put together a, a, a vision for the future of transportation broadly, which is one of the goals, and also um, a vision for what the agencies are likely going to need. Uh, and then finally, what, what concrete pavement uh, industry's uh, role is in that vision, and, and, and finally how we get there. So I think they did a pretty good job of, of really getting to all of those uh, four goals. 
Looking at, you guys had, if I'm not mistaken, you had a 1997 project that you guys were looking at or a report that you guys had. How does that differ for what you're doing here with your 2040? Or uh, talk to me a little bit about what, where are those kind of compare a little bit? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. I think um, that effort, which was um, called creating a new generation of pavements, culminated in a blueprint for, uh, for Portland cement concrete pavements. And uh, not too unlike this effort, it was really um, focused on uh, creating a, a roadmap for a kind of a next generation of concrete pavements. And it involved uh, heavily, or it was heavily focused on uh, concrete pavement research mm -hmm. and, and best practices and, and what we can do to get there. Um, what's exciting about that vision is that it uh, ultimately became the genesis for what we call the long-term plan for concrete payment research or the uh, concrete payment roadmap, which is a collaborative effort between Federal Highway Administration, the American Concrete Payment Association, and the uh, Concrete Payment Technology Center at Iowa State University. Would you look at plans like this, when you guys look long term out, I mean, we even look at the technology industry, it's really hard to look two, three, five years out. How do you look so many years out and really say we've got a vision? You know, you look at one plan project, now you're looking at others. How do you really, how are you able to do that? I know in technology it's hard. Now you're looking at roads. You, we've looked at things that have been tough. How are you guys able to put a group of people together to do it, let alone get a group of people to agree on something? Uh, that's, that's a great point. I think uh, it's certainly, um, it is difficult to predict what the future is going to hold. And I don't necessarily know that that really was what the focus was. It's really maybe a more a focus on shaping the future and um, and then and then planning accordingly, right? So as I think Yogi Berra uh, <laughs> is said to have proclaimed, if we don't know where we're going, we'll end up someplace else, right? So we got to stop and look and ask the question. And then, um, you know, again, maybe we have an opportunity to shape that future. We know that is that, that we do have that opportunity from our experience 20 years ago with the uh, with the roadmap. Um, you know, again, you mentioned the effort in 1997. What we know is that we were able to shape the future, right? We, we may not have been able to predict it, but we can impact what that future looks like. And that's really, I think, what's uh, what's important here is not necessarily nailing down what that future is, but uh, to help better prepare for it, maybe shaping it in such a way that uh, we can contribute more um, constructively and, and positively to the future. Looking at reports like this, are you able to see what you could do with the type of workforce that's going to come out of this? Because I always think that when we're looking at trying to shape things or ho hoping to look at things, are we able to look at what type of a workforce we're going to be able to have when we put people on you know, out out on the on the road, so to speak, right there. Uh, that that's a great question. We we didn't spend, uh, if I recall correctly, the, the the blue ribbon panel did not spend a lot of time contemplating that question specifically. However, um, we do have a uh, a workforce challenge um, in our industry. Of course, it's difficult to get the people uh, out there to to do the jobs. These are difficult jobs and and uh, can be demanding. So we don't have um, all the answers in that regard, but I, but I do think that as our construction industry matures and we start embracing some of the new technologies, uh, be it in just the, not just the highway construction sector itself, but the design and incorporating things like um, the technologies associated with autonomous or connected vehicles, or even um, things like um, energy storage in our pavements or in uh, charging, um, induction type pavements, uh, it's going to be uh, going to track the broader uh, cross section of, um, of folks uh, into this community, right? It will be interesting. It'll involve more than just maybe, um, you know, what's unfairly characterized as a shovel and and you know a boot kind of a um, a career. Uh, we're going to be much more involved with some of these technologies that uh, interest. I think the current generation using computer integrating that with uh, with the infrastructure. So it's kind of exciting, but we recognize there is a, a fair amount of a fair challenge there to um, to fully um, get people involved in, in, the, in the formidable you, challenges that we have moving forward. So you raise a great point because it really then describes how the industry is going to change. What we think about it today is going to be completely different than 20 years from now, because one of the questions I've, I've raised to some of my other guests is 
urbanization, what the city of the future is going to look, is going to be completely different. So does that mean the road of the future is going to be completely different than what we are thinking about as today or what it might be in 20 years from now? Yeah, wow. Um, well, one of the things that I think surprised me the most with this uh, discussion during this, I mean, it was an enormously stimulating conversation with these folks in the room. And, and one of the things that, that surprised me the most is how they emphasize that change is coming, right? So as, as you alluded, um, as you alluded to, the uh, population is going to increase. I think U.S. DOT um, projects another 70 million people or so by 2045. And um, I mean, that's a lot of people, right? That's the current combined populations of, of three large states like Texas, Florida, and New York. So with that amount of people comes a lot of freight, about a 40, 45% increase in freight as well. Um, these people are gonna have to live somewhere, right? And, and uh, this group uh, felt that um, these uh, large ex-urban areas are really gonna be, these mega regions is really where, where the concentration of people are gonna be. And people are gonna want different things out of their urban centers. So there was talk about adaptable pavements, right? Um, as, as, as our population increases and as real estate continues to uh, increase in cost, uh, pavements uh, can't afford to do just one thing anymore. And so that to me was a very, very interesting part of the conversation because if 35% of your current uh, average city is dedicated to pavements, that's a lot of real estate. And uh, I think the expectation is gonna be that, well, the pavements are gonna have to do more than that. They may have to capture stormwater or treat stormwater or maybe capture energy or uh, provide other uh, security barriers or what have you. They need to be modular or, or uh, adaptable to serve more than one purpose because it just doesn't make sense financially to have them just serve the purpose of parking and moving or allowing uh, vehicles to move on top of them. So, so that really, I think, was, uh, was quite an interesting discussion there regarding the, these urban areas and what the changes are going to be uh, vis a vis pavements. Never thought about your roads being big data roads anymore and the, what they're going to be actually capturing and the types of information when we think about artificial intelligence and machine learning and, and what that's all going to mean. You bet. So looking at it now from this report and things that you're looking at, did, did you come out with some real go forward kind of initiatives that you're really thinking some really key big points that, you know, taking it forward right now that you feel this is what you have to do going forward? Well, I think uh, this effort was really step one is to, to get the people together, um, think about the future, establish a vision very broadly. Um, and then, uh, you know, next step, uh, and we're not there yet, is to, uh, to put together kind of an action plan, right, from our industry's perspective. What are the things that need to be done in order to get there? So uh, we don't really know what those are yet, but um, we certainly feel like step one, which is to, uh, to talk about the vision, contemplate the future, uh, try to see how these uh, new technologies are going to be, uh, you know, woven into the fabric of our, of our highway infrastructure. Um, that's, that's really... Um, step one and, and uh, you know we still got some work to do well if that's just step one how are you going to fund it to get to step two because that's really got to be a big issue, right? I mean, because we talk about this, we talk about public and private partnerships. I mean, are we really going to have to try to figure out how we're going to make this all happen to be able to get to that next level? Yeah. Well, I will say that, um, you know, from a broad perspective, not necessarily on, on our end here, how to uh, fund uh, an action plan, uh, you know, from the concrete payment perspective, but broadly speaking on infrastructure, um, in moving forward, I think it's ultimately the uh, industry's responsibility to innovate, right, and the agencies to implement those innovations. And um, one of the things that I think it's important to acknowledge, particularly from our perspective, is that <clears throat> to get that, to fully marshal that innovation and, and even cost competitiveness, the highway agencies have to um, actively facilitate healthy and spirited competition between industries involved in the production of paving materials. And, uh, and sadly, that's not the case in, in every place in, in, the, in the United States. Um, we, we have to have uh, highway industries competing um, aggressively with each other in order to move innovation forward. And that's really the only way we're going to be able to position the uh, agencies to meet the formidable challenges of the future. So so there's competition. You, you know, you need to leverage that to the benefit of, uh, of the public sector. And then the other one, I think, to the uh, maybe from a from a grander scale uh, regarding funding, uh, all of this is going to cost money, right? 
Um, we need to invest properly in infrastructure and surface transportation. Um, and at the risk of getting on my soapbox here, I think um, from our perspective, what we're in effect doing right now is freeloading on investments made by a, a previous generation of Americans who are willing to belly up to the bar and invest uh, properly in the infrastructure to our success, right? Um, but unfortunately, we're allowing that inv investment go to waste. And to a certain extent, we're doing it under the false pretense of fiscal conservatism. And certainly I submit that there's nothing uh, conservative about letting our infrastructure fall apart. And what's possibly worse is that we're doing a, a, all of that at the peril of our uh, future generations, right? So increasing investment- Whose in fault is that? Whose fault is that then? Well, what do we um, have to do? What do we want to take? Who, who needs to take responsibility for that? I mean, we really, well, when you say that. Yeah, that's a, great, that's a great question. So I think I will say that we all have a responsibility in that regard. Right, so it's it's but something we that we say that, but we're not doing enough. We've talked about a failing infrastructure, but we're not doing enough. Who needs to take responsibility? We all do, but we're not doing it. We know it's a problem. Is it going to be a problem till it's a catastrophic event? Well, um, unfortunately, uh, what, what's the? I think a, it's a, a quote from. Uh, from political here. Nobody uh, went broke underestimating the uh, ability of Congress to do its job. But, um, you know, kidding aside, the, the truth of the matter is, uh, you know, Congress does have the power, right, to raise these revenues. And that's what we need to do. Um, it's this, I think it's intellectually dishonest to suggest that we're not going to, uh, that it's intellectually dishonest to suggest that it's not going to cost money to do this. And we as a population have been, um, I guess, allowing our, our legislators not to, uh, or to get away with not raising revenues, right? We, we like stuff for free. Uh, and what we haven't done a good enough job of uh, making the case for why it's important and why it's important enough to pay for. Um, we have to convince our members of Congress that they should um, invest, right? And we need to give them cover. And that's what we haven't been a very good, done a very good job so far. And But I am optimistic. I do think that we can now with um, maybe in a bipartisan way with the administration talking about infrastructure in the State of the Union, which I think is something that is notable. And uh, with both the House and Senate talking about infrastructure, we just need to do our part in ensuring that they deliver on that. So it, it's difficult, it's gonna cost money. Um, we have to be honest about that, but it's an investment worth making. That's the fundamental point here. And, um, and, and, and you know, we own it, right? We as a population, the population here as constituents, we own it. Unless we are vocalizing the need to invest to our elected officials, uh, we're really uh, hey, partly to blame. Leif, this might be the only thing that they agree on. Might be the only thing they agree on is the infrastructure and that we have to invest in. Maybe, maybe they can at least agree on something. We all agree on it. Let's hope yes. that that's true, right? I concur with that, and I think it's something that truly is uh, maybe not even bipartisan, but maybe nonpartisan is really uh, historically that's the way it's been, and and I think um, that, you know the tricky part, as you as you pointed out, I, I don't think that I never met an elected official that doesn't love infrastructure, right? But the, stick, the tricky part is is paying for it, right? And nobody likes to raise revenues, whether it's taxes or some other means. It's a difficult thing, and that's uh, but that's okay. We just well, need to cover. And if something horrible happens, they're all going to say, well, not that we should have, we could have, and we didn't. And that's going to be the sad things. Well, I'll tell you, Leif Watney, thank you so much for being with us. You're the executive vice president of the American Concrete Paving Association, Pavement Association. Thank you so much. I appreciate your time today. You're very welcome. It's my pleasure. Thank you. I want to close out the show today by talking about the next phases for emerging technologies. We've highlighted a lot of what is coming throughout this episode, but before we wrap up, we need to identify some tangible steps to implementing these systems. So here's my top five steps for implementing emerging tech. First, identify a need. Next, get buy-in. Then develop a plan. Subsequently, train, train, train. And finally, monitor for success. Let's dig into this a little bit more. First, we need to identify a need. Why is this so important? At the rate at which new technologies come to market, every single day it is increasing. As sensors get smaller and more affordable, we have the potential to track just about anything we want. 
Many things and devices need to be tracked, and there is a lot of data coming off of all these devices. With the emergence of 5G, even more data will be coming fast and furious. But we need to be careful. I've always said technology, just for technology's sake, is never a good thing. We can get lost in all of this hype. We need to first identify what the need is. Now here's an example. Almost four in 10 bridges in the United States are more than 50 years old. Roughly 9.1% of them are structurally deficient. That sounds like a need to me. It's also essential that we stay focused on what our needs are. Next, we have an obligation to rally the stakeholders and get buy-in. This is so important, especially on infrastructure projects. The big change is going to happen and buy-in is essential from the government, from citizens, from construction partners, from subs. Now here's an example. Nearly a century ago in Los Angeles, urbanization of the region led to a flood of mitigation projects. Now the river needs a renewal. The mayor acknowledged the required transformation, and today he has championed a project to upgrade an outdated system. We must urge more people to recognize that our infrastructure is failing and it needs repair. This is the only way we are going to generate the funds to build all the technology infused into infrastructure. This is perhaps one of our most challenging steps. Once this happens, the rate of adoption is going to soar to unprecedented levels. Then the onus will be on all of us to develop a strategy for how the technology will align with the business needs. A good strategy is the core of a successful technology implementation. This is true when putting technology in our infrastructure or putting new systems in place on our projects. Here are some good questions to ask in this phase. What are the objectives we are trying to achieve? What data needs to be collected? Who will be involved with monitoring all of these analytics? Work backwards. Decide what is essential when you are trying to accomplish this, and then choose the technology that works for you. Once the tech is selected, we need to train, train, train. We have a labor shortage in this industry. Within the next seven years, baby boomers are going to retire. The only way we're going to fix it is by focusing on developing the people we have and filling the gaps with technology. We need greater mentorship. We have a duty to help workers understand why technology is so important. We need to help them work alongside robotics and artificial intelligence. We need them to understand how embedded technology works and how to install it. It is coming. We have an obligation to prepare our workers. Finally, we have a responsibility to monitor the emerging technology on an ongoing basis. Is it working? Is it not? Is it providing the data we trust? What are the limitations? Professors at Michigan State University recognize that external power sources are a challenge with sensors. Thus, they have been working to develop self-sustaining sensors. Sometimes we have to take the tiger by the tail to be constantly looking at what is working and what is not. Then we can reevaluate and we can continue to innovate for the future. It will be an ongoing process. The pace of change is going to pick up. We all need to be ready. Are you going to contribute to the solution? And thanks for watching Construct Tech TV, your fierce advocates for construction.